Have you ever wondered how to have difficult conversations around race or just how to have difficult conversations in general? Then you're in luck. By the end of this video, you're going to have tips and tricks on how to do just that. Hi, I'm Rebecca Zong, top 1% attorney and the best-selling author of the books, Negotiate Like You Matter and Breaking Free, a step-by-step -step divorce guide. And I've helped thousands of people go from lives of drama, trauma, and chaos to step into lives of freedom, possibility, and purpose. And I do the same thing with you right here in these videos. So before we go any further, hit subscribe, hit that notification bell so that you can get notified whenever I upload brand new content. So today, we are so lucky to have Kwame Christian here with us. This is part one of my two-part conversation with him on how to have difficult conversations around race and how to have difficult conversations in general. Kwame Christian is an attorney. He's a TEDx speaker. He is the founder of the American Negotiation Institute, and he is here with me for this conversation. So without further ado, let's dive in to part one of this conversation. Hello and welcome Kwame Christian. I am so excited to be talking with you. First of all, you have the number one negotiation podcast in the world with 1.5 million downloads, which is pretty, pretty exciting. You are also a lawyer, the founder of the American Negotiation Institute. You are a TED Talk. I uh, person you've you've had an amazingly uh successful ted talk and um you talk a lot about how to have difficult conversations and how to turn your passion into uh, persuasion and all kinds of things but today we're going to be talking about something really really near and dear to my own heart and um also super important which is how to have difficult conversations around race so welcome welcome Kwame. Thank you so much for having me, Rebecca. So I was so excited that you, I, I, I ended up on your radar somehow um, in looking at my negotiation podcast that, that uh, tickled me to no end because you are uh, the, the 800 pound gorilla in this space. <laughs> well, thanks. I, I tell you, there. There are all these various lists out there on on like ranking podcasts and whatnot. And uh, I was talking to my team and we realized the, the negotiation podcast landscape has changed significantly. Your show is fantastic, but it's not listed anywhere on, on any of these major lists. So I said, hey, I think we should get you a little bit more recognition. I didn't know you, but I just I thought it would make sense to, to get you more exposure because you should be rewarded for the amazing work that you do. So incredibly generous of you. Uh, and so obviously anti-narcissistic, since it's something that I talk about is narcissism a, a, a lot. It's so incredibly generous and altruistic of you. So I really appreciated that. Um, and so I reached back out to you when I got your email and I said, well, hey, thank you for off, you know, putting my, my podcast up there for this list. But let's also interview each other for each other's podcasts. And um, you had mentioned that you are doing a lot of conversations around race. And for those people who are listening to this podcast and not watching this podcast, let me mention that Kwame is African-American and I am half Chinese, um, just so that people understand that this conversation around race is very personal for both of us. Um, I just think it's important that people understand who's having the conversation. <laughs> and, and interestingly enough and kismet enough, I, I really believe in synchronicity. It just so happens we're having this conversation on Juneteenth which I think is pretty awesome. Yeah, it, it is fantastic timing. Yes. So let's talk a little bit about your background first. Tell us, you know, who you are, how you got where, where you are now. 
Yeah, so I'm a first generation Caribbean American. Family came from the from the Caribbean to further their education, and um, I grew up in small town Ohio. And so, um, if you could imagine what a small town of Ohio looks like, I love my I love my friends, love the the community I grew up with. They're great people, but it it just wasn't very diverse. And um, then went to school. Ohio State University, or as, sorry, as a good Buckeye, I should say, the Ohio State University. Um, undergrad yes, as a, as a hurricane, I, I, I have to say, I don't, <laughs> we will we'll, we'll not go there. <laughs> oh, this made my day. I'm very happy now. <laughs> yes, that yes, may yes. be even more difficult than the race conversation. <laughs> right. Oh, that's funny. But yeah, so OSU undergrad in psychology and um, then law, law school and master of public policy at OSU. And so the first job out of law school was a civil rights job, talking about health equity, criminal justice, doing trainings, implicit bias types of trainings for police officers, lawyers, and health professionals. Um, but it was very emotionally taxing, just being confronted with some of the darkest parts of American society over and over and over again. And I became emotionally burnt out. And that's what led to my transition to business law, um, working with small and medium sized businesses. And I started to uh, rekindle my love for psychology through focusing heavily on negotiation. So doing more mediations as a mediator. And then I started the American Negotiation Institute to help other people to have these difficult conversations. And the motto we have, and it's really our guiding principle for everything that we do, is that the best things in life are on the other side of difficult conversations. And so with that, we feel tasked with empowering as many people as we can to have these difficult conversations. And right now in the U.S., the, the topic of the day is racial equity, and, but people don't know how to talk about it. It's, it's very difficult to talk about for everybody involved. It's highly emotional. Sometimes it's embarrassing. Sometimes there's shame associated with it. And, and really, for, for many of us, our parents told us not to talk about it because it was impolite. And so it's, it's difficult having the conversations. But if we're trying to create a more just and equitable society, we have to have those conversations. So I've been focusing a lot recently on helping people have those tools so they can be more effective. Yeah, and I can tell you that as somebody who is also of a race that has felt a lot of oppression in this country over the years, uh, I, you and I were talking a little bit before we got on the air here about how um, my family was also affected by the Chinese Exclusion Act, which is the only piece of legislation on the books of the United States that is uh, race, racist on its face and actually um, singles out one group of people. And so the, the Chinese Exclusion Act was actually on the books for, I think, 80 years, something like that. And, and my gr grandfather came over with his <clears throat> wife, my grandmother, and, and the four children, including my father. Uh, he was able to come in 1937 when the Japanese were invading Shanghai and burning everything to the ground, basically, they were able to come on a merchant visa, which is the only type of visa that was allowed for Chinese people at the time. And my grandfather ended up dying in 1948 of a heart attack, and his wife and kids were all still here. So immediately they became illegal aliens. Uh, and my my father was in medical school at Columbia at the time and was in danger of being deported. So he somehow got a stay from Congress because they, they I, you can actually look it up online that he had to get a stay from Congress from being deported. Here he was in medical school at Columbia. It's not like he was in prison or something. And... Um, he ended up having to join the Navy as soon as he was out of school so that he could get citizenship here. And so my uncle actually sent an, a letter to me this morning say, uh, talking about DACA and, you know, how this legislation affects children of immigrants who some of these children know no other home other than here. 
So it, it's still very much alive in this country. And, and all of the events that are taking place right now around George Floyd and uh, on and on and on, so many names, too, too many, um, unfortunately too many to mention here, uh, are finally bringing light to the fact that racism still exists and very much so in this country, um, unfortunately. And, and it is a difficult conversation to have. And I think, you know, for those of us who are not white people who were born here, um, 100% white, it, it, people don't even realize sometimes when they say things that are racist. You know, I, I don't know if you've had that experience, but, you know, where you go, did that person just say that with me standing right here? <laughs> can, can you relate to that uh yeah remember my upbringing <laughs> in uh, in small town ohio right but even today you, as a lawyer a fellow attorney we run into attorneys who, who say certain things that are highly inappropriate but think about this when you, you you're able to understand things when you learn them but for a lot of people when have they had the opportunity to learn how to have conversations about race, to learn about racial inequality, structural racism, institutional racism, those type of things. There's, there's a lot, not a, a pure curriculum for it. And it's fascinating to me. And because when we think about um, our, our childhood go, growing up in school, we learn a lot of useless stuff. <laughs> we learn a whole lot of useful stuff in elementary school and whatnot. We don't learn about truly how hi the history from the past, how the past influences the inequity that we see in society today. We don't understand that. We don't understand how to have difficult conversations. No matter which uh, industry or what job you have, you're going to have situations where you need to work through conflict with a colleague no matter what you do, but we don't teach people how to have these conversations. So it's not at all surprising that we run into these situations where just in general, people struggle with conflict and negotiation, but in this situation, in this topic in particular, it's equally not surprising, but it doesn't make it less hurtful. Yeah, for sure. I, I mean, even just recently, uh, and uh, I'm part of a high-end networking group, um, you know, it's a very, um, they're very, very selective uh, of the people that they allow into the group. And I love the people and I love the, the friendships that I've created there. And one of the guys is, you know, he sends out um, emails that are very, very conservative. He's a very conservative Republican, which is fine, which I totally respect whatever people's opinions are as long as they're not you know racist or biased against people or whatever but that's what he is and so he sent out this email which i'm on the list and he's talking about coronavirus and how we should all demand that china pay reparations to the world for infecting everybody with coronavirus and I'm on the list and I'm Chinese and I'm thinking, I, I can't even believe that this person, and I know that he likes me very much. I just think that he doesn't even realize how offensive and racist that is. Yeah. And we, we see that all the time. But what's so interesting is talking about reparations um, for this instance, which is very clear to him. Well, let's think about racial subjugation that occurred throughout the entirety of the history of the United States. Um, are there any going to be any reparations for, for those type of things? Right. And, and so like the concept is understood, but as it relates to things that are foreign to them, um, they miss it. And, and here's the thing that's really interesting, too, because whenever people talk about racism, I think um, people who are white and conservative get an un, undeserving amount of focus, too, because people who are progressives can be racist in, in ways that are equally damaging. And I think the fact that people who are um, who see themselves as woke, as they say, for the people who see themselves as progressive and very liberal, they think that they're almost um, 
it, they're almost cured of that when they're not. In psychology, they have a term called moral licensing. And with moral licensing, what happens is that you feel as though you've done well, so it makes you more likely to fail in the future. So for mm. example, if you're on a, on a diet, if you um, you go to the gym and you have a really, really great workout, that actually makes it more likely for you to to cheat on your diet later on because you say, hey, I did a good job earlier. And so if we bring that same concept to racial mm. equity, if you're somebody who thinks that you're doing such a great job and you're so above these base human instincts, then that makes you even more likely to be blind to the, the racial issues that you have in your own life, to your own biases too. And so I think when we have these conversations, if we equip people with the skills to, to use the negotiation skills that you and I talk about all the time, to help people to investigate thoroughly themselves and the world that they live in, I think we can solve a lot of these problems or at least some of them as it relates to our community and our workplace and our home and with our families. But again, we, people just largely are not equipped with the skills to handle these types of conversations. Yeah, I totally agree. I, I mean, I think that to a certain degree, it's like, oh, it's always a lot easier to be against people if you don't actually know them or if you haven't taken the time to get to know them. Um, you know, because human beings are, t are human beings, regardless of the amount of melanin they have in their skin. Um, everybody is a human being. And, and I think that, or, or if they have slanty eyes or if they, you know, regardless of what they look like on the outside, we're all human beings. And I think that once you get to know people as people, it really makes a difference. Um, you know, my parents were living in Northern Virginia when, um, when they got married, uh, and it was 1964, and so Loving versus the State of Virginia did not come out until 1967. So they actually were not allowed to get married in the State of Virginia because my father was Chinese and my mother is German, uh, or she's American, she was born here, um, and they had to get married in D.C., because that was the only place it was legal at the time. We're not talking about 200 years ago. We're talking about my parents. So, you know, I think part of the problem with the racist stuff that's still going on in this country is it's still fairly new that there's this, these laws about equality. I mean, you know, the Civil Rights Act was 1964. You know, I mean, that's not a uh, hundred years ago, right? I mean, right. this is still fairly, and, and, and slavery was going on for hundreds of years before that. So it takes a long time to fix those wounds, that pain, I think. Yeah, absolutely. And and the thing is, again, that that speaks a lot to structural racism. Thanks for joining me on this part one of my incredible conversation with Kwame Christian. If you haven't already, make sure you hit subscribe, hit that notification bell so that you can get notified when I upload part two. And in part two, we're going to dive even deeper into how to have these difficult conversations around race and also in general. If you are getting ready to negotiate with a high conflict personality or just negotiate at all, you can grab my free Crush My Negotiation prep worksheet. It's 15 pages. It's basically an ebook. You can get it at the link below or you can just go to winmynegotiation.com and it will be all yours for free. If you are dealing with high, high conflict personalities or toxic personalities or narcissists and you want extra support or you want to connect with other people who are dealing with the same thing you're dealing with, Join me in my free private Facebook group. It's called Narcissist Negotiators with Rebecca Zung. And if you like this video, give it a like, give it a share, drop me a comment. Let me know that you were here and I will see you in the next video. Remember, today is a great day to start negotiating your best life.